Welcome to episode 24 of my guide to video game history. In this episode we're going to look at the Sega Dreamcast, which is one of the best and most underrated gaming consoles of all time. So without further ado, let's begin to tell the story of this awesome machine. The year is 1997, and the Sega Saturn was struggling, squeezed out of the market by the unprecedented success of the Sony PlayStation and the reasonable popularity of the N64 console. Sega therefore decided to cut their losses with the Sega Saturn, and instead concentrate on designing a new machine that would beat the current consoles hands down. And if they got there first, they figured, they stood a chance to win back the gaming console market. So they set up two development teams with the brief to design the next Sega console. The first team was headed up by IBM researcher Tatsuo Yamamoto, who actually spoke to the game developers and built a proposed console specification based on their input. The proposed design was based around the 3DFX graphics chip, and as that is what the game developers were saying would be the next big thing, and for the processor they used the SH4 chip. The second development team was set up internally within SEGA, and it was headed up by Hideki Sato. They also opted for the SH4 processor chip, but for graphics they instead went for the powerful, but little known, VideoLogic PowerVR2 graphics chip. Initially, SEGA chose to go ahead with Tamamoto's 3DFX based design, and started moving in that direction. But a few months later, when a leak in the 3DFX company spilled the beans on them working with SEGA on the new console, SEGA decided to switch designs, feeling that the 3DFX company was not trustworthy for them to work with. So in June 1997, six months after starting the 3DFX design, SEGA instead moved ahead with Sato's PowerVR design instead, codenaming it Katana. But this sudden switch of design frustrated many developers, as some had already started work on the previous specifications. One such company was Electronic Arts, who had previously made their name on the Sega Mega Drive console. EA was becoming increasingly frustrated at Sega and their continual different systems being released, with EA losing a considerable amount of money in the games that they had been producing for all these consoles. William Bing Gordon, who is now Executive Vice President of EA since 1998, had been frustrated by Sega initially asking them what they wanted in a console, and then when EA responded that they would back the console only if Sega put in a great graphics chip, such as the 3DFX, and a modem, of which Sega agreed to. But then, after six months, Sega switches the design, and so EA believed that Sega's new machine would flop, and they decided to no longer support the Sega console. So, by November 1998, Sega's machine was ready, and it was a wonder to behold. It had taken inspiration from the N64 with four game ports, an analog controller with a diamond-shaped button layout. It also had analog trigger buttons to use with racing games. The controller also had two slots on it, one to add a rumble pack, and a slot that allowed you to insert a visual memory unit that not only allowed you to play and save your games, but also had a small LCD screen that could be used to show in-game information. This VMU device also had small controls on it, allowing developers the ability to upload small basic games to the device that a gamer could even take around with them and play. Excitingly, the machine also had a built-in modem, which would allow the console to go online and on the internet, and also play games online. Also, the machine could read the new format GD-ROM, which, although was CD-sized, allowed almost double the storage of a normal CD disc. It was clear that Sega had made a marvellous machine, but all that now remained was would the public, who had also been burned by Sega's continual hardware releases, would they be willing to spend on yet another Sega console, after so many previous flops by Sega. 
The console was shown at the Tokyo Game Show of 1998, and it garnered mass excitement from those who attended, queuing up to play the games on display, particularly Sonic Adventure, which was now in glorious 3D, and Virtua Fighter 3DB, a great conversion of the arcade game. Both drew huge crowds, with the machine being the hit of the show. So, on November the 27th, 1998, Sega released the Dreamcast to the Japanese market for 29,800 yen, about $220. Although, due to problems with their manufacturer making the chips, it meant that they did have quite a huge shortfall of Dreamcasts available for the launch. And so, it resulted in many Japanese gamers going home frustrated and empty. Handed. Nevertheless, excitement was still high in Japan and the onlooking world, as its launch titles such as Virtua Fighter 3 TB, which had been such a huge arcade hit in Japan in particular, and the game really showed the console's power, being an amazing home conversion. The other launch titles also impressed, with Godzilla Generations. Actually, quite frankly, this was a terrible game, being a bit like Rampage, but in full 3D. But as it had the hugely popular Godzilla in full 3D for the first time in the game, it was a commercial hit in Japan. The final launch game was Pen Pen Triathlon, a really cute Olympic-style racer, where you have to race across snow, sea, and land. Bernie Stoller, meanwhile, who had been instrumental in the first PlayStation release for Sony of America, had joined Sega now, and he was determined to work with Sega, regaining their market share and their previous glory. He would do everything right in the preparation for the Sega launch in America, with a major advertising campaign, a memorable launch date of 9th of the 9th, 99, and ensuring there would be a stack of launch games geared towards the American audience. The one mistake that he perhaps made was it was taking so long in the preparation of the US launch, with it being a full year, and so losing the head start Sega had made for itself over the competition. As the year 1999 progressed, Sony would announce their new console, the PlayStation 2, to the world, and they promised the Earth with such enticing concepts as the emotion engine that would make graphics so realistic that you could actually feel emotion in a game. This hyperbole worried Bernie Stoller at Sega, as he felt that promises made by Sony's new machine would cause gamers in America to hold off buying the Dreamcast. Therefore, Bernie wanted to lower the price of the Dreamcast to cost price. This would be a risky choice for Sega, with them not making any money on the hardware itself, and instead relying on the sales of games and licensing to recoup the costs. Bernie Stoller and Sega of Japan strongly disagreed on this point, and so, with only a month to the launch date, Sega of Japan fired him. But thankfully, although Stoller had gone, Stoller's team was all in place, and so the launch went ahead as planned on the 9th of the 9th, 1999 for $199.99. The launch was a huge resounding success, with over 300,000 consoles pre-ordered, and thanks to a year's delay from the Japanese launch, meant that they were armed to the teeth with a wonderful array of 18 launch games, ready for the new machine, with something for everyone. Things look rosy for the new console. Sega were back. The most impressive US launch title was definitely Soul Calibur. The game looked gorgeous, looking as good as the arcade game, but actually it was even better than the arcade game, as it expanded the game with extra modes, such as survival, team battle and training. Another big hitter was Sonic Adventure, which took Sonic to the beautifully realised 3D world. Although in retrospect the game wasn't as good as the 2D Sonic games, it was nevertheless enjoyable enough, and certainly pretty enough, winning over many gamers to the new Dreamcast console. Also, with EA games not on board, Sega had to look to develop their own sports titles, and they did a sterling job with the launch title NFL 2K, which had really impressed gamers and gaming press alike, with it not only looking absolutely stunning, but it was extremely fun and enjoyable to play, with many gamers actually preferring this to the Madden game by EA. If that wasn't enough, 
for American football fans, they also had Midway's arcade-fueled sports game NFL Blitz 2000 that took the sport but filled it with constant fun-fueled action. Think NBA Jam, but done in American football. Other fighters in the launch lineup didn't disappoint either. There was Capcom's Power Stone, which took the beat em up in true 3D, with multiple players on the screen at the same time, and it would result in frantic, hilarious all out action. Also, Midway had released Mortal Kombat Gold, which had the entire rosters of fighters from the fourth game, and an additional six characters as well. Then there was Marvel vs. Capcom, Clash of the Superheroes, which perfectly emulated the arcade beat-em-up and showed that the Dreamcast was at home with 2D as it was with 3D. Finally, for fighting games, there was Midway's Ready to Rumble arcade boxing game that really impressed with all Gorgeous graphics and humour that really felt like an update to Nintendo's Punch Out in all but name. For racers, meanwhile, there was Hydro Thunder, a great conversion of an OK arcade game that had you tear across the landscape in a powerboat. Then there was TNN Motorsports Hardcore Heat, or more pithily known as Buggy Heat, over in Europe. Next, there was Tokyo Extreme Racer, which was like a simplified version of Gran Turismo, although not as good, that had you race around Tokyo City. Then there was Flag to Flag, a Formula 1 racing game by Sega, which had an amazing sense of speed in the game. Next, there was the incredibly tough Monaco Grand Prix, which did impress at the time, until you actually got to play it. Finally, for racers, you had the wonderful Trick Style, a futuristic hoverboard racer that was enjoyable, fun, and quite unique alternative to the typical racing fare. For those who love shooting games, meanwhile, you weren't disappointed either, for you had House of the Dead 2, a perfect arcade port of the Sega Zombie Blaster that when combined with the light gun peripheral meant the gamers finally had the arcade game in their home for the very first time. Then there was Blue Stinger, an all-out action horror game that was quite good fun. Then there was Expendable, an all-out blaster that was okay. Next there was Aero Wings, an enjoyable arcade flight shooter. And finally there was Air Force Delta, another arcade flight sim shooter that was fun as well. The following month, on the 14th of October 1999, Sega released the Dreamcast in Europe. And again, it was to huge interest, selling at £199.99. Originally, it was going to be released on the 23rd of September, but due to problems connecting to the internet in the UK, they delayed it by three weeks. The launch in Europe was limited with consoles available, however, due to the unprecedented popularity in the US. Still, however, things in Europe were just as popular, with gamers and gaming press lapping up the new Sega machine. Sony, meanwhile, continued fanning the hype on the PlayStation 2, promising more and more outlandish claims in a bid to make gamers wait for their new machine. The Sony PlayStation 2 would finally be released in Japan on Saturday the 4th of March 2000. And although the launch was not completely hitch-free with the consoles in short supply, it was nevertheless met with huge enthusiasm by the Japanese gamers. The console itself was a wonder to behold, with Sony's new console design to look far more adult and less toy-like, looking in place amongst your high-end designer electronic gadgets than an actual console. Everyone loved this new grown-up look, and the ability to store the console vertically or horizontally made the console fit around the gamer's lounge. The controller, although looking similar to PlayStation 1 controller, was perhaps one of the greatest game controllers of all time. Using two analog sticks now, and a built-in rumble pack and pressure-sensitive buttons that worked brilliantly for 3D and 2D games alike. The machine was also backwards compatible with the PlayStation 1, meaning that gamers could still play their old games. But perhaps the most enticing feature was that the console had a DVD drive, so gamers not not only could play games, but they could watch DVD movies. In Japan, this was particularly enticing, as at the time DVDs had yet to take off in the country. So for many gamers who had yet to buy a DVD player, they finally had a PS2 console available that was not only the cheapest DVD 
CD player on the market in Japan, but it could also play games as well, and so it won gamers and non-gamers over alike. So, with the same device being able to play games, music, movies, and with the hugely popular PlayStation 1 game being compatible with the PlayStation 2, it would make it a clear choice for many deciding which console to buy. The launch games for the PS2 in Japan were a strange lot, quite frankly, with some good games thrown in, such as Ridge Racer 5 and Street Fighter EX3. But none of the games showed any of the fable promises that Sony had been promising prior to launch, with many of the early games being quite disappointing. I think it's telling, for example, that in Japan, in its first year of the PlayStation 2 being released, the best-selling disc for the console was not a game, but the DVD film The Matrix but more on the PlayStation 2 in the next episode. So, with the PlayStation 2 having so much strength in all three regions, the PlayStation 2 would go on to be a huge success in the casual gamer market, with the Dreamcast instead only being popular with a much smaller hardcore gamer market. So, despite a slew of classic, exclusive titles released for the Dreamcast, Sega would struggle more and more. By March 2001, with the Nintendo's GameCube and Microsoft Xbox scheduled for release later in the year, and with Sega having more Dreamcast consoles sitting on shop shelves and warehouses than actually sold, Sega admitted defeat and officially announced that it would discontinue the Dreamcast and would leave the hardware market exclusively to concentrate on game publishing. And so sadly, the last bastion of the gaming console geared towards hardcore gamers would fade away. Meanwhile, the PlayStation 2 would eventually prove how powerful it truly was under its hood, and it would go on to be the best-selling console of all time, selling to date 150 million consoles, and it was still selling up to 2010. But as we all know, a console is only as good as its games, and the Dreamcast was chocked full of great games. And so in the rest of this episode, I'm going to discuss some of the very best best. In January 1999, Tazu Mazuguchi would give a sterling conversion of the Sega Rally Championship 2, that despite the odd frame rate glitch here and there, was a full arcade experience in the home. Then there was Seaman, meanwhile released in July 1999. This was the quite frankly batty Tamagotchi style human fish pet. Strangely compelling, it even had Leonard Nimoy, no less, talking you through the game, offering you advice on how to look after your pet. The game was a surprisingly enjoyable, being wonderfully unique title to play. Also in July there was Revolt, which was a fun remote control game that did surprisingly accurate simulation of the real thing, and had you race around a stack of fun racetracks set around a housing block. In October, Sega would release Sega Bass Fishing, complete with the special rod peripheral. It was based on the obscure Japanese arcade hit called Get Bass and it was a welcome, fun diversion for gamers who wanted that something that little bit different. In November this year, Sonic creator Yuji Naka brought the world Choo Choo Rocket, a twee, addictive puzzler that really came into its own when played in multiplayer. This was one of the first games to really sell the virtues of playing online via the Dream Arena or SegaNet internet service as people played each other across the internet. IGN gave the game 9 out of 10. December, meanwhile, Tazu Mazaguchi would return with the brilliant rhythm action game Space Channel No. 5, which had you play Ulala, who must rescue the hostages through the power of dance. The game was great fun and dripping with coolness, even if it did have a rather freaky cameo of Michael Jackson in the game. But it would be December 29th that the best and most ambitious Dreamcast game was released in Japan, and it was called Shemu. The game was the brainchild of Yu Suzuki, and it was an ambitious undertaking, costing Sega an unprecedented $47 million, the most expensive game production of all time up to that point. But what a game it was, offering you to play Ryo Hakuzi, who must wander around the beautifully realised town called Yokosuka in Japan, 
Set in 1986, it had you hunting for the villain Land D and avenged the death of your father. The game, part adventure game, part RPG, was interspersed with quick time action events and basic fighting. I remember playing this when it first came out and I was blown away by the sheer detail absolutely everywhere, with it really feeling like you were visiting Japan in the mid 80s. The game also was stacked with mini-games from forklift trucks, motorcycles and best of all a fully working arcade cabinet of some of Yu Suzuki's previous classics, namely Space Harrier and Hang On. The game started out as an RPG based on the Virtua Fighter universe and they called it Katana. It initially started life on the Saturn, but when it was clear the Saturn was coming to an end, they brought it across to the Dreamcast instead. The game would see a sequel the following year in 2001. This time took Rio in Hong Kong and added even more to the story and it included fantastically extra games, such as a fully working Outrun arcade machine built in as well. The game wasn't to everyone's tastes, with some seeing the game as too slow. But for me that's missing the point. This is a vacation game to get away and enter another life entirely and experience another time and place like no other game before. Sadly the game was commercially a flop in that it didn't recoup the estimated 47 million that it cost for production and so the planned concluding part was never made, leaving the story frustratingly unfinished. In February 2000, Crazy Taxi was released. This was another fantastic arcade conversion. A brilliant, if shallow, arcade racer, but with a difference in that you had to dash around the city picking up and dropping off passengers. And it showed that Sega still had it when it came to arcade races. IGN gave the game 9.6 out of 10. In Japan, the same month, they would release Tokyo Bus Guide, kind of the anti-Crazy Taxi game that had you, again, go from bus stop to bus stop on time, but this time you had to obey the road laws. Amazingly, this was a home port of another Japanese arcade game. Capcom, meanwhile, released Resident Evil Code Veronica this month, and it offered gamers a chance to play a prequel to the original game. The game was the best yet in my opinion, offering a chilling story and making full use of the more powerful Dreamcast hardware. The Sonic team meanwhile would return the following month with Samba de Amigo, an arcade conversion which had you play a monkey called Samba who armed with some controller maracas that came with the game had you shake your way through great renditions of Latino music classics making this the ultimate party game. In March, meanwhile this year, The Typing of the Dead was released, being amazingly a home port of another Japanese arcade game. This combined the keyboard peripheral and light gun game together and had you frantically type out the words to shoot the zombies in House of the Dead 2. Far more fun than it ought to be, this game was such a cult hit that the following year the US would see it released there as well. In June this year, Jet Set Radio meanwhile was released, or Jet Grind Radio as it was known in the US, and this was another huge critical hit for Sega as you skate around a Tokyo-like city doing graffiti whilst listening to a stack of awesome jap pop tracks. In July 2000, Liverpool-based Raising Hell Software, who'd come onto the scene all those years ago with the Killing Game Show on the Amiga and was still riding high with the Formula One games on the PlayStation 1, this year they renamed themselves to their new name Bizarre Creations, after Sega pressured them into changing their name to not have Hell in the title. The first game on the Dreamcast that they would release was the cute shooter Fur Fighters, which had you running around blasting away, being a hugely entertaining game. But in November this year they would return with their second game, which is one of the best games on the Dreamcast, and it was called Metropolis Street Racer or MSR for short. Ah, what a game! It totally revolutionised the way to do racing games, with you racing around realistically mapped out streets of London, Tokyo and San Francisco. 
and it had you carry out five different events, offering huge amount of variety as you attempted to earn as much kudos as possible, and so scoring either bronze, silver or gold depending on the amount of kudos you earned. It was this setup that made the game so addictive, with each time you wanting to perfect a challenge that little bit more and get that little bit more kudos as you raced around in licensed cars with your personalised number plates. The music as well deserves a mention, offering a pseudo radio station that was stacked full of great songs that were localised depending on the city you were racing in. If all this sounds familiar, by the way, well that's because after the Dreamcast would close shop, Bizarre Creations would go on to the Xbox and Microsoft and create the game Project Gotham Racing, which was a revamp of their MSR game. In June 2000, Infogram's new division after acquiring Sheffield studio Gremlin Interactive, whose team had previously brought such classics as Hero Quest, Zool and Little Devil, and incidentally are better known today as Sumo Digital, doing such Sega classics as the home port of Outrun 2, Sonic and Sega All-Star Racing, and Sega All-Star Tennis. But for the Dreamcast, they would come out with the classic Go! game, Wacky Races. This used a clever flat texture on, technique guys. that made 3D cars and tracks look like they were lifted straight out of the Hanna-Barber cartoons. And when combined with a pretty solid Mario Kart-esque game, it truly impressed. The game was amazing for the time, with such presentation and race commentary and voices from the cartoon that made big kids such as myself smile with glee. July also saw Virtua nice Tennis board. released, board. another board. brilliant board. conversion board. of the arcade board. smash board. hit board. that gave board. a highly board. playable board. game of tennis board. that was really board. impressive, especially playing two or four people. Then there was F355 Challenge Passion Rossa, released in August 2000, which was based on the brilliant new Suzuki AM2 arcade game that was wowing on the arcade circuit at the time. The conversion on the Dreamcast is pretty much arcade perfect. It may have only had one car, like the arcade, and only 11 circuits to race around, but what a car, and such handling, and gorgeous graphics that made your jaw drop. IGN gave the game 9.2 out of 10. Also this month, Sega Worldwide Soccer 2000 was released, an enjoyable arcade football game that admirably filled the gap left by having no electronic arts licensed sports titles for the system. September, meanwhile, released a sequel to NFL 2K with NFL 2K1. This offered more of the same, but gave gamers the ability to play the game online. Yes, the idea of being able to play another gamer anywhere in America. For many, it was the first gamer's taste of online gaming. And armed with a Dreamcast keyboard, you could even type to one another during the game to send taunts. IGN gave the game 9.5 out of 10, stating that although the games online were slow, it still ran remarkably well. In October 2000, Rico Kondama, who has been a game designing veteran since Championship Boxing in 1984 and would go on to such hits as Fantasy Star Games and Sonic the Hedgehog, but for he would create the brilliant Skies of Arcadia, a lavish RPG that had you fly airships in a pirate compelling fantasy world. Another classic this month released was Headhunter. This was a Europe only title which is a real shame as other regions missed out on a pearl of a game which offered us Metal Gear Solid style game or siphon filters, offering stealth gameplay but set in a compelling futuristic Los Angeles which had a wonderful backstory. If you haven't tried this game on the Dreamcast, not talking about the PS2 poor conversion here, then it's well worth giving this game a go. Another November classic racer was Looney Tunes Space Race from Infograms, which took everyone's madcap heroes such as Bugs Bunny, Daffy Duck and Taz and ten other Looney Tune racers, offering a game that was part Wipeout and part Mario Kart. 
December 2000, Sonic Team Yuji Naka was back again with another classic called Fantasy Star Online. This took the seminal series online for the first time and allowed many to experience their first taste of online RPG for the very first time and all the mad addictive pleasures that that can bring. The game was extremely addictive and had lots of innovations, with emphasis being on cooperative play to take out large monsters. The game was fantastic, until you got your phone bill that was and realised how much you'd spent. Daytona USA meanwhile was released in March 2001 on the Dreamcast and it finally allowed gamers to play an arcade perfect version of the 1993 arcade hit. The game was immense, improving the arcade original with even more tracks and game modes. 18-wheeler American Pro Trucker, meanwhile, was released in May this year. This time it was another AM2 arcade release, but it had you racing a big American truck. But unfortunately, whilst the arcade game was a great laugh, with all the big steering wheels and paraphernalia making it great fun, on the home port, just through a Dreamcast controller, the simplicity and shortness of the game became more apparent. Another great May release was Confidential Mission, which was a great home port of the obscure light gun arcade game. This time it had to play two Mission Force spy agents who must save the world. The game was great, taking inspiration at every turn from such spy classics as James Bond, and they'd taken all that they had learned from the Virtual Cop series, but offering more enticing spy-based locales this time. In June 2001, meanwhile, the second Sonic game, Sonic Adventure 2, was released. This improved things greatly over the first game, with the camera finally sorted out from the first, and even better level design, making this one of my favourite Sonic 3D adventures to date. Sega's AM2 division were back again this month with Outrigger. This is a Japanese take of the first person shooter and a home port of their little known arcade game. The game ran solidly, allowing a change of viewpoint between third and first person which was a nice touch. It was just a shame that the controls in the game weren't that great and online play, very important for a first person shooter, was a little too choppy to be playable. Then there was the brilliant Rez, another Tazu Mazaguchi classic, offering a surreal online shooter that had you flying through a beautiful Tron stylized game, shooting and creating a beat to the hypnotic music tracks. The final game I will mention is Ikaruga by Treasure, released in September 2001. This was a beautiful vertical shooter, being a perfect port of their arcade game. The game is rock hard and takes lightning reflex as you blast your way through the beautifully realised 3D backdrops. What made the game so special was the polarity bullet system, having you match certain enemies and so invulnerable to certain bullets at certain times, adding a real strategy element to the proceedings. Also for high score junkie addicts, there was a wonderful combo chaining system that allowed you to chain together attacks to get that extra high score. In summary, the Dreamcast was a gorgeous machine, chocked full with some brilliant arcade conversions and important all-time classics released on it. It really was the last console released that was willing to take risks and produce something that little bit different. In essence, it was a console made by gamers for gamers, and it showed with every glorious pixel and shaded texture. It's just sad that Sega decided to pull out of the hardware market altogether, and ever since, gaming has lost a little bit of its gaming soul. Well, that's the end of this episode. Look out for my next episode, where I look at the PlayStation 2 in more detail and talk about the great games that were released on it. So until next time, see you later.